Have you ever sat and stared up at the stars and wondered, where did we come from? Let's take a journey like no other, not to a place, but to a time. Join us as we delve deep into the human past and explore our shared human origins. Welcome to the world of paleoanthropology. Hello everybody, this is Seth from the world of paleoanthropology. Today I'm very excited to be presenting our second morphology video, a part of the Story of Us show. I know it's been a long time coming, and of course I wish it was sooner than it was, but I'm glad to be getting this out now. Today we are going to be discussing one of the first, if not the first, of the Homo genus. And of course we're talking about Homo habilis specifically KNMER1813, which of course is Kenya National Museum and then the reference number of this species. Now we're going to be going over this in detail, hopefully a little more than we did for Afarensis, as I have learned a little more of what you guys are interested in. And I hope that we will be able to learn and discuss these things together on the page and in our groups as we go forward. So in case you missed our first video, I would definitely suggest you take a chance to look at it. You can find it on our website or right here on YouTube. So let's get started. Who are we talking about today? As I mentioned, we will be discussing Homo habilis, a very special hominin. Aren't we all though? but we'll be learning about where they came from and where they are, what happened to them, etc. Homo habilis is best found around the Turkana Basin, Kenya, and around the Old Divide Gorge, made famous by the Leakies in Tanzania, East Africa. With a typical brain size of 450 to 550 cubic centimeters, these creatures were very small and very primitive much closer to the shared ape ancestors than our more recent relations, the modern living apes. When the species was first discovered, again by the Leakies, Lewis, the patriarch of the dynasty, had to convince others in the field that this was the first in the line of something very special that we had not seen before. Having a brain size under the 600cc threshold that had thus previously been set for hominin homo, or hominin homo genus, it was a challenge to make the scientific community understand at the time, and continues to this day, that perhaps Homo habilis does not belong in the genus Homo due to the fact of its small cranial capacity and a few other features. Homo habilis, which means handyman, was to be the first in our line of ancestry, the first in our line to become modern humans, Homo sapiens. Coming from about two million years ago, these creatures were believed to be the first to use stone tools, although that date is constantly being pushed back, possibly showing that other hominins were responsible for the first stone tool use, such as Australopithecus, or possibly even species of Paranthropus. As the first in our genus, we have a great deal to learn about H. Habilis. But he does not answer all the questions. While he does help fill in the gaps in humanity when we first arose in Africa, many questions remain to be answered. It seems that so many questions as usual which gain answers lead to more questions. So what do we know specifically about this guy right here, KNMER 1813, which was found by Kimoya Kimu in 1973. The specimen dates to about 1.9 million years old to the very roots of the Homo genus itself. The cranium is one of the most complete habilis skulls yet found. Again, the cranial capacity of this particular specimen is about 510 cubic centimeters. It's slightly skewed, as you can see in this 3D print, by the geologic forces that were applied to it over the millions of years of fossilization. This is a very important and informative find towards the beginning of our species and understanding where we came from. Let's just take a quick look at this guy. Notice all the fine details. 
And again, notice how small he is, and I apologize if my hands are shaking. They tend to do that a little bit. We can see just once again, and I'll bring someone in for comparison in a moment, just how small this is. And again, this is most likely an adult, but we remain at such a small size for just about everything, including the teeth, the dental arcade, just about everything is miniature compared to what we would consider modern human proportions. Now, again, compared to an anatomically modern human, there are, of course, massive differences, such as size as well as general, general moral, morphological features. We have much larger brain sizes. We have smaller brows. They, however, have a larger brain than any ostrilopith that has so far been found, thus distinguishing it from its predecessors. We have very similar eye orbits, as we can see. The nasal cavity is much smaller and more ape-like than ours would be. And this specimen is more prognathic, which of course is, again, how far the face protrudes from the bottom jaw, from the midline. And we can see if we were to cut it here, quite a bit projects past my hand. And that is of course what we call the prognathism of this particular specimen. Continuing to look at it, we see that it is just clearly not human. It's on its way but we're not there yet. We have quite a way to go. To compare it to something a little closer to us as far as time goes and as far as evolution, but still quite distant and far from H. Abelis himself or themselves, we're going to take a quick look at a, another extremely famous fossil, Turkana boy also known as Narakotomi boy, the most complete Homo erectus skeleton ever found, once again by the Leakeys, Richard Leakey, specifically in Turkana, Kenya. We can see just side by side the absolute size difference in these two skulls. And again, Homo erectus, although much, much more closer to an anatomically human morphology, is nowhere near even the size of, again, our skulls and our brains, but much bigger than H. Havilis here. The postcranial remains are also quite different between the two species. As with H. erectus, we have the first signs of what one could call a modern human body. They stood completely upright. They could walk, they could run. They were about our stature, if not taller, as this Nerakotomi boy here was a child and yet stood about six feet tall. So we can imagine that they would have gotten larger if they, or if this specimen had reached full adulthood. Now they of course both belong to the genus Homo, which considering the morphological differences may surprise some. However, once again, Hablis kind of had to fight for its spot in the family line of Homo. And perhaps some of us can see why, and also some of us can see why this specimen is so drastically different from previous Australopithecus that had been found, and why it is designated as Homo. Again, taking a look at Turcana boy, Homo erectus versus Homo habilis which many consider Homo erectus to be the follower in the genetic line for our species, the next step evolutionarily in the general scheme of things. Now, the stone tools that the two of them used would have been very different. Homo erectus created and adapted stone tools known as hand axes that are found all over the old world, in fact, even throughout Europe. Some Neanderthals used them in the beginning before they developed more refined technologies. But of course, we find them all throughout Africa, especially in sites such as Kenya and Turkana, where these specimens have been found. Now, 
Habilis, on the other hand, used very simple stone tools. They pretty much found some rocks, slapped them together until they got either a beating rock or a slicing rock that was able to perform what they needed. And this, of course, completely altered and changed the behaviors of these hominins and what they were doing and why they were doing it. Of course, they were both hunting, not necessarily hunting, they were both consuming meat, and it was just how they were getting that meat, Homo erectus possibly hunting, while a Chavalus was most likely scavenging using said stone tools to remove meat from a carcass as quickly as possible and returning home before the predators or anything else could come and drag them along. Now, when we look at Homo erectus once again, we can see the difference in the brow size and the shape between H. erectus and H. habilis. Of course, the eyes are much smaller on habilis. The brow ridge is smaller. The teeth, although it's quite difficult to see because this erectus skull actually has a mandible while the habilis does not. But you can kind of see the starting of the tooth differences, although they're very similar almost in size because of course they are the same genus, we do see that perhaps Homo habilis does have more things in common with other members of the genus Homo than thought without these findings. We have very similar size and teeth, very small as all members of the genus Homo have, and that is of course because of our diet and the morphological changes that we have had from eating meat and eventually cooking, fire, etc., which have been very important. The use of fire, of course, as we know it, has been extraordinarily important in the biological and morphological changes, as well as behavioral changes that we find in the Homo lineage that we do not simply see in other hominins due to this lack of fire, this lack of cooking, that Richard Wrangham is so famous for explaining in his book, Catching Fire, How Cooking Made Us Human. Now, when we think of this, Erectus was the first to actually, we believe, master fire. Now, if that's the case, we can definitely assume that this massive change in cranial capacity and size is possibly due to that. The more nutritious foods, the easier foods they were able to get, all of it made it so Homo erectus could be one of the most successful hominins that we have ever known. The first to leave Africa and to travel quite all the way around the world almost, say the New World. Now we're going to look at more of the facial features of Homo habilis, which are similar and yet unlike what we have seen in Australopithecines. First of all, although of course we have discussed that H. habilis is more prognathic than modern humans, it is much less prognathic than many Australopithecines, such as Lucy species, which we looked at in the first video, Australopithecus afarensis. It's distinct, but it does not have a massive orbital torus, but there definitely is one that is present, as can be seen above the eyes, as that is what that is called, the brow bridge. And then, of course, we see, it's difficult to see because this specimen is missing them, but the zygomatic arches are quite small, especially where they should be here, compared to something like Nerakotomi boy, where, again, the temporalis bones are a little missing, but they are supposed to be right there, and they are... Basically, the cheekbones and designate how much flaring a face is, how high the cheekbones are, and such things. And we can see there's definitely morphological changes between H. erectus and H. habilis. And again, possibly due to the difference in muscle structure that was used to masticate food and prepare what they needed. Now, to look at the more cranial features, which in this 3D print, are a little hard to see. We of course have the frena magnum, which would be right about here, which is exactly where it should be for a bipedal animal, allowing them to look straight forward as they walk forward. This allows them of course to see where they're going, see what they're doing, and allows us, because of our special necks and our special spines, to turn our heads and see what's going on around us. When we compare the dimensions of 
H. erectus and H. habilis, and especially Homo sapiens, we'll see that the progression of brain size and other morphological features become a mosaic of changes as we develop and as we go on. Of course, things get larger, except in the case of the hobbits of Flores, the Lanzienses, etc. But eventually we believe that this led to this, which led to other species, and eventually we find ourselves where we are today with anatomically modern humans, Homo sapiens. But it all started, we believe, with this guy right here, Homo habilis, the first quote-unquote human, the first in the genus Homo, the tool maker, the handyman, and, well, that's pretty much what there is to say about this for now. Of course, this is not an utterly in-depth video. This is an introduction to this specific specimen, which is, again, K-N-M-E-R-1813. We will be seeing them, him, her, I am not sure, much later. And we will be comparing them to other 3D prints that I have, other craniums, skulls, and we'll be introducing other species as well. But again, this is just a species introduction to Homo habilis and to see what it looks like in hand, in person, not in person, but as close as we can get in these times of pandemic and whatnot. And again, the look with Nerakotomi boy, Turcano boy, Homo erectus, big differences. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I liked making it. Just get a few more close-ups of this guy. You can see the features. I will post pictures along with this so you can see high-resolution detailed images as well to go along with this video for your own analysis purposes. And I will also be posting information on our next video no, I do not know when that will be, but I do know who it will be on and what, will we, what we will be discussing. So please stay patient for that. I hope you all have a wonderful time. And it's actually Thanksgiving on the day I'm recording this, so I hope you all have a wonderful holiday, as this will be posted quite soon. And have a rest of your wonderful week. Thank you. Thank you for adventuring with us into the human past. If you've enjoyed this video, check out our website at www.worldofpaleoanthropology.org and find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.